one thing we always want to know is how long will it take my program to finish? That's not really easy to predict just based on a general description of an algorithm. There are just way too many variables. So we could ask instead a more precise question, how many instructions will the processor need to execute? This is also really, really complicated. It depends on all kinds of implementation details. It could change from one day to the next. So we're going to reduce this question down to something more manageable, which is how many operations will we perform on floating point values? And we call these operations flops. So each addition, subtraction, multiplication, square root, and so on is going to count as one flop. Now this is an oversimplification. Flops are certainly not the only thing going on, and sometimes other parts of the program are much more time consuming. But it is something that's useful, especially when the problems are very large and the flops can dominate. So the question we're really going to ask is, as the problem grows, what is the leading order behavior of the flop count? So let's say the problem size is called x. And we have an exact count of the number of flops, f of x. What do we mean by the leading order behavior? And the idea is that since this isn't a real precise measurement anyway, we want to relate it to a much simpler thing, g of x. And there are two major ways of doing this. One is to write that f of x is big O of g of x. What that means is that the ratio of f to g is bounded above as x goes to infinity. So f grows no faster than g. The other notation is a bit more precise. We say that f of x is asymptotic to g of s using a tilde if this ratio actually approaches 1 as x goes to infinity. For example, if you have a polynomial like 2x to the fourth plus 3x plus 7, well, that's big O of the highest degree term. And it's asymptotic to that term with the coefficient attached. That's a simple consequence of doing limits. Another example would be that x is big O of e to the x. Certainly that ratio is bounded, it goes to zero. But it's not very informative. So while it's true, it's not something we would typically say very often. Here's a more exotic example. Sine squared of x is big O of one because sine squared over one is less than or equal to one but it's not asymptotic to one because it has no limit as x goes to infinity. We won't really be doing anything with sine functions and flop counts. So here's a case study in flop counting, the multiplication of two matrices. So we have the inner product formula for the product of A and B. So each entry is an inner product, which is a sum of products, and C has M by P entries. So we could write a little pseudocode for this with nested loops. For the inner product, we'll do a little accumulator pattern. So you see all the flops are contained in this innermost line, and there are two flops, one multiplication and one addition. Now, if we want to be very picky, we really only have to do one flop in the very first case because when you add something to zero, you can do that for free. So suppose we take that into account. Now the outer loops mean that we're going to do these things m times and then inside that we're going to do them p times. The innermost loop on k gives us 2 times n minus 1 flops except for the first case where we have just one flop. Well, that inner number, 2n minus 1, doesn't depend on i or j. So we can pull it right through the sums. So this innermost sum gives us p. And that doesn't depend on i, so we can pull that through the sum. So we get the mp from the double sums. In other words, we do these inner products independently mp times. So the total flop count is m times p times 2n minus 1. 
Now that gives us three parameters. It's a little complicated. So let's take the simplest case where both matrices are square. And in that case, the FOP count is 2n cubed minus n squared. So we'd say that this is order n cubed, big O of n cubed, and it's asymptotic to 2n cubed. So whenever n doubles, you'd expect the flop count to go up by about a factor of 8 when n is large. There are some tricks we have for trying to observe this kind of polynomial growth in practice. Let's suppose that the dependence was exactly the leading order, constant times n to a power. Of course, that's only approximately true as n grows. But if it were exactly true and we took the log of both sides, what you'd find is that the log of the value depends linearly on the log of n. So if we were to graph it, f of n versus n on a log-log plot, we get a straight line. And in fact, the slope is that exponent alpha. We can take it a little bit further if we normalize f by its value at some n0 then we find that the constant just cancels out. I and mean, we can write the whole thing as a normalized value of n to the alpha. So if we do a log-log plot of that, then in fact the intercept should be at the origin. The case of matrix multiplication was quite simple. In general, there's a very useful identity that we need in order to deduce these flop counts. And that is that the sum from k equals 1 to n of k to a power p is asymptotic to n to the p plus 1 divided by p plus 1. What's great about this identity is that it's very, very similar to just integrating x to the p. So it's very memorable. So let's test the idea that flop counts tell us something about execution time for matrix multiplication. For example, here I have two matrices of size 2000 by 2000, and I multiply them together. In MATLAB, you can use tick and talk to time an operation. So let me go ahead and run that. And you see it was quite fast. So in fact, when it's this fast, you probably can't trust the timer that much. It only has a limited resolution. So when you have a fast operation, you should probably do it multiple times. So here I'm going to time doing the operation 20 times and then take the average at the end. And so this is probably a slightly more reliable figure. If I do it again, maybe I'll get something pretty close to that. You see, it even, even so, it does fluctuate. OK, so here's our experiment. So I set up a vector of n values. So starting at 400 and steps of 400 up to 4,000. And then for each of these entries in n, in the vector n, I create matrix A and B, random, of that size. And then again, I run matrix multiplication 20 times, and I record the average time that it takes. Now I want to make a table of the results. Let me start this while I'm talking here. I want to make a table of the results, but the table function wants column vectors. And when you use a colon, you get a row vector. And when you create a, a vector by assigning to it, you get a row vector by default. So I have to transpose them first. And then I create a table out of the results. OK, so here are our results. And what we can see is that the time goes up as the size of the matrix goes up, but it's kind of hard to tell anything about the rate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make another table. This time I'm going to scale everything. I'm going to scale the times by the first time, so everything will be relative to the smallest case. And I'm going to do the same for n and then cube it to compare. So if the time goes like n cubed, we should get nearly the same results. OK. So you look at these and you think, well, these numbers aren't particularly close. But that's a little bit deceptive because as the numbers grow, the gaps between them can grow. So it's much better if you want to test 
a polynomial growth like n cubed to make a log log graph. And so here I'm going to graph the relative time versus n, and I'm going to the plot the relative n cubed to n. And so here you see the dots are the actual data, and the dashed line would be perfect n cubed growth. And so they're not identical, but especially at the larger end here, you see that the slopes are the same. And so that tells you that in the long run, as the problems get large, it probably is going to scale very close to n cubed. So here's a code for doing LU factorization. I've stuck with the outer product form here, unlike the one in the book, but the count comes out exactly the same. I've also written the code so that it's not doing any unnecessary arithmetic. So when a result is known to be zero, or if it's an operation of zero, it's being skipped here. So there are exactly two lines that do any kind of floating point operations. When we look at the first one, it's this vector divided by a scalar. Now the length of the vector is the final index minus the initial index plus one. Each entry of that vector is divided by a scalar, so that's one flop for each entry. And so there are n minus k flops for that line. On the second line, we have two things. We have an outer product here. And again, each of those vectors has length n minus k. And so you get an n minus k by n minus k matrix, each entry of which is one multiplication. And then with that matrix, we do a subtraction with a similarly sized matrix. And so that means we have that many subtractions as well. So altogether, that line contributes two times n minus k quantity squared flops. These are all inside a loop on k. K ranges from 1 to n minus 1, so we have to add them all up. Now to make this a little easier to deal with, I'm going to change the summation variable. It's a lot like changing an integration variable. So if j is defined to be n minus k, then that means k is equal to n minus j. And when k is equal to 1, then j is equal to n minus 1 at the bottom. And when k is equal to n minus 1, j is equal to n minus that, which is just 1. And so now the sum simplifies to j plus 2j squared. Sums don't care which order you go, unlike integrals. So we can just convert these, we can convert these into sums from 1 to n minus 1. And now we have two sums that I can apply our summation identities to. So we now, everything up to this point has been exact, but we are now passing to an asymptotic approximation. And if you expand n minus 1 squared, well, the leading term is n squared. Same thing with n minus 1 cubed. So the result is finally asymptotic to 2 thirds n cubed. So that's the flop count for LU factorization. It's kind of interesting compared to what we did before that this is actually three times faster than matrix multiplication. So it's actually easier to factor than it is to multiply.